Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's webinar focused on healing in crisis. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna give folks a few minutes to log on and then we'll start shortly. And those of you who just joined us, thanks for logging on today um, to our webinar on healing in crisis. This webinar is offered by the Office of Victim Services through a program called the Training and Technical Assistance Request Program, or TARP. Um, and today we'll, we'll talk more about TARP and of course dive into the topic. And we're very excited to have this really important conversation with you all um, and during this important time. Um, I'm Mia. I'm a policy analyst at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Government. We support OBS and offering TARP and all of TARP's offerings, including the webinars. And um, we encourage you to add your name and organization to the chat um, just as a welcome. And, and I'll pass it to Blake from OBS to, to get us started. All right. Thank you, Mia. And hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So welcome to the 2023 OBS VAP Training Center webinar, Healing in Crisis, Empowering Frontline Workers and Survivors of Trauma. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm Blake. I'm the Training and Outreach Unit Chief at OBS. And our director, Elizabeth Cronin, is traveling. She's in New York City today, and she sends our best wishes. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is just cover a little bit of webinar housekeeping before turning things back over to Mia. Uh, so today's webinar is a part of a series of webinars that we offer through the VAP Training Center and in partnership with our TARP program, where for the last few years, we've hosted a series of webinars designed to help you tackle some of the unique challenges and pressing issues that you and the programs you might work for may be facing at this time. And so we're hoping that today is no different. Uh, in fact, it seems as though this topic may be one of uh, the most in-demand ones we've offered recently, as this has had one of the highest registrations for a webinar we've had uh, since the TARP series started about a year ago. Uh, we hope that you get the most out of the training, and if you do want to go back and revisit what was covered, have no fear, today's webinar is being recorded, and we will publish it on our YouTube channel in the coming days. You can access those links, other resources on the VAP training page on our website, which is just obs.ny.gov forward slash training. We'll put some of that in the chat too. And then finally today, when you do exit the webinar, you'll be directed to an evaluation survey. We'll also give you a link to it right before the webinar closes. Please take a couple minutes and just give us your feedback. Each one of our webinars is built off of previous webinars feedback that we've gotten, and it is incredibly helpful. We also share it directly with the expert presenters or any of the other trainers that come in. So it's really helpful for them to help, you know, improve anything that they do in the future as well. So it's incredibly valuable and, and we, we thank you for the time to do that. That said, I'm happy to turn things back over to Mia. She can talk a little more about TARP and introduce our expert presenters. Thank you, Blake. Um, I'll screen share just for a few minutes and then pass it off to the guests of honor. Um, but today I wanna share a little bit about um, the, this program we have, the Training and Technical Assistance Request Program. Um, we call it TARP. It's what makes these webinars possible. 
As I mentioned, we at CUNY ISLG help create and implement TARP um, and, and all of its offerings, including today. Um, so, you know, broadly, TARP provides webinars and individual training and support to victim assistance providers across New York State. Um, through TARP, victim assistance programs are able to request indiv individualized training and support based on their needs. Those trainings can focus on a whole range of topics, um, organizational leadership, communication, strategy, trauma-informed supervision, um, and if you request training through TARP, and we can't offer it in-house, we have a consortium of 50 plus consultants who are experts and we connect you with those experts to offer the training to you. And all of this is at no cost to you. Um, we've put here a handful of example trainings that we offer and topics of trainings we offer. You can see our full catalog services on the OBS website. And you also have the ability to request training that falls outside of the categories we have on that catalog. Um, to request these services and that individual training and technical assistance from us, it's very easy. You um, fill out a, you go to our course catalog, select a training or topic area, and submit a form. Um, the important piece is that an executive director or program director must submit this form um, on behalf of your organization. And, and once you do that, we assess it, we reach out to you and we start the training. Um, and so all that together, it's very simple. I'm, I'm excited to pass the mic now to our main presenters for today. Um, that's Verena and Josie, and we're really grateful to have them with us. I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Mia. I am going to share my screen. And all right, welcome everyone. We are um, presenting Healing in Crisis and we're gonna tell you a little bit about ourselves, and we are going to set the stage for what is to come during the presentation. Um, I'm gonna let my colleague Josie explain this slide. <laughs> Thanks, Verena. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And I love seeing all the places that people are logging in from. Such a wide uh, variety in terms of geography and workplace settings. And really glad to have you here. That being said, some of you need to leave. No, just kidding. That being said, what we wanted to do was just set the expectation that what we're doing today is a very basic overview of a little bit about trauma and the brain and neurobiology, um, a little bit about what it looks like to work in a trauma-informed workspace, and some, some introductory tips to working with crisis, and then of course, taking care of ourselves. So we wanted to make sure that if you're staying, and we, we would love for all of you to stay, but also to make sure that we're setting the right expectation as to what we'll cover. So we're not doing a deep dive into clinical work or into therapy, but really this is intended as kind of an introductory conversation and dialogue around um, initial contact crisis and stabilization with people. Um, and if we can put in a plug, you know, we can we could do a deeper dive for a future series. Um, okay, so but I just wanted to let you know that much like uh, pumpkin spice lattes, fall Uggs, uh, we're also very basic and here today. So, all right, now we're gonna tell you a little bit about ourselves. My name is Verena Salvi. I work as a um, sexual assault forensic coordinator and social worker at Columbia Presbyterian with the DAF program. I have a private practice in New York City where I see mostly survivors of trauma. I teach at Columbia University. I teach at the Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy. I am a clinical partner with Headstrong where I provide free services, clinical services to veterans who returned from Afghanistan and Iraq. I am a mom of an adorable two-year-old toddler 
And my fun fact is that, as you can probably hear from my accent, from my strong accent, I was born and raised in Italy, but I've now lived in New York City longer than I have lived in my country of origin. I left Italy when I was 18, and I've been in New York now for 20 years. Not only have I managed to retain a very strong Italian accent, but I somehow managed to acquire a very strong American accent when I speak Italian. So that when I do go back to visit, I'm often told, you speak Italian so well, which is both weird and funny uh, to me. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Josie Torrielli. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I also am a lecturer at Columbia University School of Social Work. Uh, and for the past couple of years, I've worked as a consultant, uh, working with individuals, organizations, and systems to help people better understand trauma. Um, I have a long history of working with sexual violence, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, um, and I'm really interested in um, understanding neurobiology and using that knowledge to help people um, receive expert and compassionate care. And what that also means is that I'm super fun at parties. Um, so let's see, what else can I tell you about myself? Uh, I'm also a mom, two kids. Um, and I tend to, well, true story, I once told a room full of um, district attorneys that they should dance out their stress together, because that's what I do when I get stressed out, is I um, put on some music and, and dance it out, and I'm a terrible dancer. So it serves a dual purpose of making fun of myself, embarrassing my children, and releasing stress. Um, and I'm really psyched to be here. I've known Verena for a long time and she is my very favorite co-presenter. So we're excited to be partnering to bring you the content uh, and hope that you're going to get as much out of it as you can. Oh, that's me again. Okay. So I'm seeing people still coming in. That's amazing. I'm looking at where people are coming from and really hoping that we can interact in a way that you can with 348 people. Um, <clears throat> for the moment, what we also wanted to do is because we'll be presenting um, information about trauma and also some information in terms of case pre presentation, um, what we wanted to do is just encourage you to take care of yourselves during this webinar. If you do have some activation, please feel free to step away. Feel free to step away even if you don't have some activation. If you need water or need a break, that's totally fine. Um, what we're encouraging is that you get from the webinar what you need from the webinar and that you don't push yourself further than that point. So that being said, uh, as we're all coming in and introducing ourselves and kind of settling into the space, just wanted to encourage you in whatever way that feels right to just take a moment and notice yourself wherever you are right now. Maybe you can just notice the, the, the chair or whatever you're sitting on or wherever you are. Maybe take a moment to notice the environment around you. Take a moment to notice your thoughts and just give yourself a moment to get here into the space that we're sharing together for the next, uh, the next hour or so. And I know that we're often coming from busy mornings and we probably are going right back into busy afternoons, but just being able to give yourself the ability to be present in this space for right now. Maybe even noticing your breathing and giving yourself some space there. And basically doing whatever you need to get yourself into a place for curiosity and learning. Okay, now that we are zened, <laughs> we are ready to get right into it. From a place of curiosity and learning, those are 
this is an overview of what we are going to share. Josie and I encourage active participation and perhaps active participation for some of us is also a way of keeping us grounded and present. Um, I'm not able to monitor the chat and I don't know if Josie is able to, but we trust that Mia is able to monitor the chat and it's up to your comfort level. If you want to ask a question, we also welcome, you know, you unmute your microphone and ask a question. Um, throughout the presentation, there are times in which we might have to speed up and other times in which we can slow down and take our time. Okay. So let's start with trauma and the brain. There are so many definitions of trauma out there, and for the most part, they all point to the same thing. I like the definition of Daniel Siegel, which is a professor of psychiatrist at UCLA and an author of several, several books um, focused on trauma and healing. And what he says is the simplest way of defining trauma is that it's an experience that we have that overwhelms our capacity to cope. So what makes trauma overwhelming rather than, you know, going through a very stressful event, but we are still able to keep, you know, our wits, we are able to use our coping skills. What makes trauma overwhelming often is a sense of inescapability, a feeling of paralysis. In other words, the belief in the moment, there is nothing that we can do to change what is happening to us. The activation of very extreme and to some degree opposing responses in our brain. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means. The isolation and the loneliness in the aftermath of a traumatic event and the lingering of the experience, which often is what survivors refer to as life before and life after the trauma. And when we talk about what is the activation of those extreme and seemingly opposite responses in the brain, the evolution dictated the way that our brain developed and our brain develops bottom up, right to left. Since the very beginning of life, this is how the brain develops, bottom first, top after, right first, left after. And we can think of the structure in the bottom right hemisphere of our brain as the emotional kingdom of our brain. And this is where primary what it's called primitive processes take place. And we can think of the top left structures in our brain at the rational kingdom. The way that I like to make sense of it is that my bottom right brain is concerned with surviving and my top left brain is concerned with thriving. And so why, why do we lose the ability to access the structures on the top and left hemisphere of our brain, because we cannot thrive in life unless we survive. And I think it was Maya Angelou who said, surviving is important and thriving is elegant. And evolution has decided that elegance serves no purpose in the pursuit of survival. In fact, it's the very opposite. Structures in our brain that we need to thrive may hinder our ability to survive. If you think about it in evolutionary way, if we were to be chased by a lion, we couldn't stop and trying to make sense of their experience. That is the domain of the top and left brain, and that wouldn't be good during a trauma. The top brain, the, the favorite job of the top brain is to, exp it's to explain, to modulate, to regulate, to assign meaning, to create a narrative around a story. And all of those structures that will make life better and allow us to thrive are likely going to get us killed during a traumatic incident. So the brain decides what we need is bottom and right structures. And what are the bottom and right structures? Are the structures that hold primary emotions like shock, paralysis, confusion, rage, shame, terror and humiliation. And all of those intense emotions, we cannot benefit from the regulation and modulation of the top brain. They will assign meaning, they will give us an explanation, they will filter through the most intensity of those experiences. So I like what Tarana Bark say about what it matters and what it leaves you with. Trauma leaves you with a overactive 
top right brain and underactive, um, sorry, overacting bottom right brain and underactive top left brain in the pursuit of survival. So what is lost in the battlefield of survival? We are losing the structures that require modulation, regulation, explanation, and meaning. What are these structures? Connections, curiosity, flexibility. A lot of times when we work with survivors, sometimes we hear things like survivors of trauma are difficult to work with because they are so rigid. They see things as black and white or they are avoidant, they are dissociating. This is the direct result of acts of courage in the face of trauma. And unfortunately, they have had to sacrifice all of the state and processes that are only possible when we can fully engage our top left side of the brain. So what, what survivors are often left with, flight, fight, freeze, disconnection, avoidance, rigidity, and anger. In summary, trauma is most often connected with a sense of helplessness. It's marked by activation of reactions that are solely, solely in the purpose of surviving. They are not in the purpose of looking good on the victim stand when and if our case goes to trial. They are not in the purpose of making sure that detectives or people can believe us. They are solely for the purpose of surviving. And because surviving required such extreme activation in the brain, we don't get to just deactivate. We don't get to just say, the trauma is finished. Now I'm going to fully re-engage my top and left side of the brain. It takes a lot of work for survivors to be able to go back to the dance of seeking and protecting, seeking and protecting. Let's talk a little bit about polyvitimization because we are going to uh, provide you with case examples of work with survivors. And we have chosen work with survivors of polyvitimizations because it's so often that the people we see coming to our agency, our shelters, our hospital, they are survivors of different and multiple time, types of victimization. Polyvictimization refers to the experience of multiple types of victimization, such as sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, bullying, exposure to family violence, as opposed to multiple episodes of the same kind of victimization. Uh, a lot of research regarding polyvictimization poly is done in regard to trying to prevent polyvictimization happening to children. Like I said, we all get to work with survivors of both multiple assaults and polyvictimizations. Some of us only get to meet these survivors when they are adults. This is an example of something of a survivor who came to see me after she received what was fairly good services from another provider. She had a tremendous amount of PTSD symptomology and that provider to some degree was able to lessen the symptomology of PTSD. However, this survivor, by the time she came to me, she still felt so badly about herself. So what was happening here, even though she had received services and to her own admission, she had received quite good services. What left her feeling so badly about herself? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. What happened is that she disclosed to her service provider that she had been molested as a child. She had experienced intimate partner violence and sexual assault as an adult. And the service provider told her, maybe we need to look at this as a pattern and patterns are rarely this random. Life can be random, but not this random. So what happened is that the service provider, although the service provider did say, you know, it's not your fault, the implication here is that she was somewhat responsible for having been victimized over and over again. This is again from the work of Daniel Siegel, where attention goes, energy flows. The medical model and the social justice model are different speci specifically in the delivery of justice to survivors. The medical model has some good components to it because this service provider was able to lessen the symptomology of PTSD. However, in the lessening the symptomology, the survivor was left feeling badly about herself. 
So in the medical model, the emphasis is in the dysfunction within a person. In this case would be what is wrong with this person? Why does this person keep getting victimized? What I practice is the social justice model. So the moment that I sat down with this person, I never thought to myself, what is wrong with them? What I thought is what wrongs have been done to this person? So I focused on the elements of injustice around her rather than something wrong within her. The medical model focuses on how do I help this person recognize the ways in which they are putting themselves at risk versus what my work was, which how am I going to help this person recognize and honor the fact that she acted in ways that were courageous. She acted in ways that allowed her to keep going in the face of injustice. In the medical model, the idea is to change the person. How do I change this person's behavior so they're going to lead safer life? In the social justice model, the idea is how can I be an agent of change around injustice? I don't need to change this person, but this person is facing a tremendous amount of injustice in her life. So how do I change? And if I cannot completely change, how do I lessen the elements of injustice that are allowing and contributing for multiple victimization? And I'm gonna give you some real life example in a moment. What is the injustice here? Well, the injustice is that having been the victim of childhood molestation, having experienced intimate partner violence and sexual assault is not a rare occurrence that indicates that there is something wrong with the person. What it indicates is that interpersonal and gender-based violence, they're not only crimes, they are established form of oppression. And we need to recognize the sexual violence, domestic violence, exactly like other form of oppression, like racism, xenophobia, homophobia, are pervasive and embedded in the structure of our society. And once we recognize this, we can stop the narrative that survivors need to change something about who they are and their behavior, because the clinical narrative serves two streams of injustice. It pathologizes survivors who are going to end up feeling better about who they are, and it allows people who commit or cause harm to escape accountability altogether. So let's practice a little bit. How do we, in practice, choose the social justice model versus the medical model. When this person said to the other provider, I am tired of this happening to me over and over again. The provider said, well, why do you think they keep, this keeps happening to you over and over again? What I said to this person, how does it feel to have this happening to you over and over again? I'm going to honor and privilege the impact that injustice had on you. I'm not going to question what you did to cause an injustice. The provider said, well, it sounds like you might be using alcohol in ways that put you at risk of being hurt because the sexual assault that she experienced in, uh, in an adult life, as well as the quote unquote, worst intense instances of intimate partner violence were connected to the alcohol was present, alcohol was used. What I say to her was, well, it sounds like you had to find a way to make the unbearable bearable to keep going. And we should be really grateful that there is a part of you that has never given up on you. There is a part of you that is saying to you, I'm going to keep you going no matter what adaptation I have to do. The provider said, well, how can we work together to minimize your consumption of alcohol when you are not in a safe space, which is basically implying that if this person had been sober, she would not have been victimized, which is ridiculous. What I said is, what do you think needs to change in your life for you to be able to feel safe, suited, in control, and careful? I continue to work with the survivor for about two years. And by the time we finished working together, not only had the PTSD symptomology diminished, but she no longer felt badly about herself. She recognized that she had been braved. She recognized that she was worthy of dignity and love and respect. So she was able to get the whole experience that compromises dignity and respect. And it would not have been able just using we wouldn't have been able to do it just using the medical model. 
Okay, thanks, Verena. Um, I just want to pause because um, I am looking at the chat and thank you so much because it looks like it is really resonating with a lot of folks to reframe the lens to think about uh, rather than cause, effect, action, right? It, to think about um, what are the ways in which we can increase justice and not limiting that to structures that are in place or thinking about that as one particular path, but what does it look like to think about what justice means for someone who's survived violence and how can we increase and augment that within the power that we have working within multiple systems. So um, thank you everyone for that, for that feedback. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what it looks like to practice trauma-informed care and so I would say that just starting off, certainly part of it is adopting this lens of, you know, where am I starting from and what do I, how do I look at survival? How do I think about survivorship? How do I think about coping mechanisms that people utilize in order to exist in a world post-trauma? Um, and how do I, you know, adapt to thinking about those things in ways that are non-judgmental and recognizing the parts of people that survive. One of the things I encounter the most in practice is when people learn a little bit about trauma, they are very, very careful with survivors. And I think that is lovely. And I also want to honor what Verena was talking about, which was there's a part of you that has been fighting to get here. And I really deeply acknowledge all the things that someone has done to survive and to thrive before they're reaching me. So I would say that trauma-informed care is recognizing those parts that don't have anything to do with the trauma and being able to highlight those within our care, recognizing that coping mechanisms are what, in fact what they are and not pathologizing coping me mechanisms that people are using. In fact, making a good effort to understand those coping mechanisms and not just understand, but to honor them as a way of getting that person to the point they're at today. So what it means is understanding and responding to the effects of trauma. And certainly that can include knowing, you know, just a little bit about neurobiology, trauma, and what Verena was talking about in terms of brain structures, right? And incorporating that into work. For me, it also, what it also looks like is recognizing the impact of working with trauma on the people who work with it how it impacts the culture and community of organizations that work with trauma, particularly when it comes to communication and the ways in which um, people feel within their workplaces. And thinking about not only, you know, what is the impact of one individual working with and absorbing the impacts of trauma on another individual, but how does receiving and holding that information um, resonate throughout not just the provider, but um, how does that resonate through organizations? So what kind of culture um, forms, how do organizations do their best to support employees and support each other? Um, how do we, how do organizations and systems try to mitigate the isolation that working with trauma can bring? Um, so all of those things so that our self-preservation and keeping our humanity intact isn't just a function of the person who's working on the front lines, but is also a function within the communities that we work and live in. So I've already kind of said this, but I wanna reemphasize that trauma-informed means we're making room for strength and we're acknowledging that healing is about identity restoration. So what we're thinking about is exactly what Verena's case example was talking about, which was, you know, reduction of symptoms and helping people achieve more, you know, stability and ease within their daily lives. Um, and at the same time, thinking about, you know, what are the other parts of you so that trauma is not your whole story, um, but it's part of your story, but that your other parts are able 
to emerge. Okay. So how do we do that? How do we actually <laughs> work in a trauma-informed way? Um, sorry if you're hearing the horn. There's uh, some sort of emergency crisis in my town, and this is how we call people. Um, so one of the ways that we need to think about is when we're working with someone is noticing their music, right? So we, I once was in a training where there was discussion about, you know, what do we need to notice when we're working with people who've experienced trauma? And the difference between those two was thinking about music just as, you know, the lyrics or thinking about music as an entire experience. So if you can think about, you know, your favorite song and just think about the lyrics, that might invoke some kind of feeling or emotion, right? But if you can think about if you've ever seen that performance live, or if you've seen a video, or if you think about it with, you know, instrumentals added in, how that experience might be different than when you're just looking at the lyrics. So one of the things that we do when we're working in a trauma-informed way is we're paying attention to not only what people are saying and verbalizing, but we're paying attention to their presence in the room, right? We're paying attention to when they might be activated or when they might be feel like they might be dissociated or might be not present. We're paying attention to tone of voice and we're paying attention to the volume of their voice. Um, and in order to do that, we need to maintain our own presence within that space, right? So we're not only paying attention to how that person is showing up in the space with us, um, but we're also paying attention to what does this look like for us, right? So are we grounded in the space? Are there times when we want to leave the room? Um, are we able to be curious and gentle with ourselves around? Yeah, sometimes it feels like we need to gain a little bit of distance from what we're hearing. But what it means is being in tune with ourselves and our presence or absence within the space. One of the ways that we have of, yeah, Verena, you can go forward. <laughs> Um, that's built in neurobiologically is this idea of mer mirror neurons, right? So if you look at the picture, you'll notice that uh, one of the neurons, they look like little creatures. So one of these little neuron creatures is experiencing like a little zap and the other one in the mirror is saying, ow, right? So what mirror, mirror neurons <laughs> refers to is that the same areas of separate brains will activate in response to action and observation of action. So if I am synced up with you and we you know, have evolved so that we can maintain those kinds of connections with people, um, if I see you, you know, reaching for something and grasping something and eating something, sometimes the same area of my brain will light up as if I were performing that same um, motion, even though I'm not. So those evolve so that we can facilitate understanding and so that we can connect with other human beings, right? So I'm not saying that we should like geek out and talk about neur neurons, unless of course the people you're working with that are really into that, then go ahead and geek out and do it. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that one of the crucial ways that we can provide justice to people that we're working with is to be present and to notice all of their music, to notice um, and to do our jobs with humanity and understanding and connection. Okay. There's other some really, you know, kind of concrete ways that we can think about trauma informed just individually. So we can just be thoughtful about what our space looks like, what it's like for people to enter and exit into our space. We can think about any noises like that siren that just happened in my background. Um, and what we want to do <clears throat> is we want to provide the biggest amount of transparency and control that we can within the relationship. One of the things that we often try to do when we're working a trauma is try to plan for everything. <laughs> and we know that that's just not possible. But what we can do is we can try to minimize the amount of surprise within our environments and within our relationships. So we can do things like providing information on our role, providing information on how long our interaction might last. We can offer choices where it's possible and we can think about the future and think about what might be required or what we might be doing next. 
And also think about that in terms of communication. I think a big thing that stands out for me is always this idea of why and that medical model of, you know, why do these things keep happening to you or why did you do that? So really thinking about the way that we're interacting and communicating with people, being aware of our own presence. And then of course, because we know that trauma can impact memory or ability to be present, we wanna check for clarity and be prepared to explain things, maybe in a different way or explain things more than once. So we want to kind of enact all of these things as a way of individually um, providing this idea of trauma-informed care. All right, Verena, you can go forward. So just in summary for this section, just remembering we're thinking about progress and not perfection here. When we think about trauma and we think about the ways in which brain, the, our brains are impacted by trauma, we wanna make a lot of room, a lot of room. And this, this ties in with this idea of being really careful when working with trauma survivors. We always approach this work with the understanding that our brains are capable of wonderful and amazing neuroplasticity throughout our lifetime. And um, that is true of the people we work with. And that is true of ourselves as well. So give yourselves curiosity and patience as you are navigating these ways in which working and how you're integrating maybe new information. We also are thinking about this idea of holding on to both being in the space with, um, with our clients and also maintaining this idea of hope right? So that we're not promising everything's going to get better, but we are holding out for that possibility that everything's not going to look like this the way it looks like now. And then we're also allowing ourselves to make mistakes, right? So one of the really beautiful things about being human is that we always have the opportunity for repair. So there are definitely going to be times when we misunderstand maybe when we say the wrong thing. And if we're present and we notice that that can land in the wrong way, what we do is we have the opportunity to repair that. We can revisit and we can say, you know, I noticed that you had a reaction and I was thinking a lot about what I said. And I wonder how it felt for you when I said X, Y, Z, right? So we don't have to be perfect. We just have to attend to it when we, um, when we're human. Um, Mia, I see a hand, so I'm wondering if there's a question from our audience. We do. We have a question, um, an anonymous question, about the effects of trauma and and how they disappear if they disappear. Um, so the question is, does the effects of trauma ever disappear? I experienced trauma some years ago, but I'm still consciously aware of my surroundings um, and still have reactions of defense um, automatically, even after several months of counseling. That's a great question. Um, I want to thank the person who asked that. Um, I think that's a question that we get really frequently. And I would say, and I know, Verena, you want to chime in here too, but I would say that um, as someone who works with trauma, as a trauma therapist and as a crisis worker, our goal is never to have people forget the trauma. It's not something that will ever uh, be totally erased but as something that you live with and that when the impacts of trauma come up, that you have the skills and the resources and supports that you need um, in order to cope with that experience. Yeah, and, and to expand on um, what Josie just shared, I think the, the language used, thank you so much to the person who was courageous and vulnerable in sharing their experience. And I think the words I hear are, does trauma ever disappear from the brain? The idea of disappearing, right? So I think what happens is that can, can we as human beings return to a state in which we can return to modulate and regulate and enhance the states of connection, curiosity, flexibility, all of the things that were taken away from us in the surface of being hyper alert and being, you know, defensive of ourselves. 
absolutely yes. Nothing disappears from our system. Once we recognize that those were the courageous, brave parts of ourselves, we recognize that we are not going to make them disappear. We are going to honor them. We are going to thank them because they got us to this point. And then we're going to let them know, I got it now. Thank you. You got me here. Now I can relax. I can be curious again. I can be flexible and all of that. Yeah, uh, I would say it's taking the trauma from being the main story to being just one part of the story. Yes. Thank you for that question. Um, and please, um, if you do have other questions, feel free to, we're always happy to stop and spend more time. Okay. Um, so let's think about this idea of the other part that comes up, I think a lot of times for me is my fix it part where because working with trauma is messy and because we have to make room for a lot of nuance and we have to be um, really open and vulnerable and brave ourselves, sometimes there's a part of me that's like, Josie, we need this to be more exact. You need to be able to get out your magic wand and you, be, you need to be able to make this all better because this is this person is really suffering. So what we want to do is instead of, you know, saying like, fix it, park it, get out of here, right? I want to be like, okay, thank you for trying to help me feel more in control. It's okay. This person, that's not what this person needs. And I know that there are no easy fixes, right? So just being aware of our need or our want to like fix things or to make things really simple. Sometimes we want to make things black and white. Um, so just being aware of that tendency within ourselves. Okay, so our next slide is thinking about, we wanna just think about you know the shame that people will generally hold. We could do a whole other webinar on shame um, pitch, um, <laughs> is thinking about you know what people might have shame about the um, parts that we're honoring or the parts that enabled them to survive, especially if they froze and didn't fight. That's what we see most often in our practices. Um, we want to think about people's internal dialogues matching what external messages they're getting, right? So we know that people who have experienced trauma and particularly the kind of trauma that we're working with, which is domestic violence, sexual violence, there's internalized parts that people will blame themselves for the things that happen to themselves. And those often get reinforced enforced by external messaging, um, whether it's um, direct or that well-intentioned, but also victim blaming message that happens. We wanna consider the path someone took to getting to where we are and to telling their story. And then we also wanna just consider our own experiences, biases and judgments. So we wanna consider our lens and be kind of continuously be curious about those things. Um, and so I'm gonna let you re uh, review since everyone has copies of the slide this idea about compassionate listening. But I'm really curious and interested right now, um, and if Brainy you could go to the next slide, um, is thinking about, so if we're thinking about trauma-informed care, and we're thinking about this idea of um, what does trauma-informed care look like? So is there something that you how are you going to incorporate, like maybe there's something new that you've thought about today, or maybe there's something that you're already doing, but how in your way do you create a trauma-informed environment? Okay, great. So you can either use the chat. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and solicit some information? I have that open right now. So no two traumas are the same, right? So recognizing that there might be separate incidences, right? Okay. Other ways in which you might be able to incorporate your knowledge about trauma, or maybe even something that you've heard today. Listen to hear. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Trauma and stuff to be present. Yep. Using terminology that resonates. Awesome recognizing strength mm -hmm. for a yeah active listening resilience yeah 
people are different. So victims of the same crime might have different responses, mindful of language, meet them where they are, mirroring, paying attention to verbal and physical body language aware, normalizing. This is amazing. Yep. Be careful. Believe that person. Yep. Listen with compassion, honoring the effects of trauma and then letting go. Seek out the heart behind the behavior. I love that. Validate. Don't pathologize. Yeah, recognizing that they might not have realized how traumatic it was for them until they talk about it. Yep, separating my trauma isn't your trauma. Mm -hmm. Yep, not comparing experiences, being aware of your own thoughts. They're not alone. Awesome. That's excellent stuff. Okay. Respecting silence. Yes. Yes. Good supervision. Great uh, zooming out and talking about the kind of communities we want to encourage. Yeah. Oh, may I see another question? Yes. Yeah, so we have two um, in the Q&A function. So one of them is, do you have any tips for how to reteach re our brain to communicate with the social model versus the medical model? This is a tough area for me personally to unlearn or change my communication skills. That's the first one. And the second one is it is is it common to feel afraid to let go of your trauma as the main story to just a part of your story? Or why do you think some people may feel afraid to let go of it? Thank you, Mia. I want, I want to say that in the service of time, the very first question, how do we switch from a medical model to a social justice model, will hopefully be answered in the few slides we have, as we're going to cover crisis intervention from a social justice model. Um, and the second one, Josie, if you want to answer it now, or maybe we can also, I have a feeling that it will be somehow somewhat answered um, in the next few slides that we have. Yeah, I have it noted. And I mean, my my really brief and probably inadequate, but hopefully will be answered in the coming time that we have left is this idea of if you've lived with trauma and your responses to it for a long time, it makes perfect sense to me that that would be something because you've learned how to do your life in that way. And so what that approach means is that we're moving at a pace that looks right for the person who is embarking on that change. And we're honoring the huge part of change in that journey. Okay. So right now I'm going to let you go on to crisis intervention. So I'm, again, I'm mindful of time. Are we meant to end this in like 30 minutes, but leaving a few minutes at the end? Are we meant to end this in about 20 minutes? Okay. <laughs> we might have to sacrifice some content, but that's fine. Um, I, you have the slides, so I'm actually going to let you read this part of how to prepare for crisis intervention and what to let go of. Um, in the service of continuing to talk about the medical model versus the social justice model, when I was researching what is the, uh, not the universal, but what is the common definition of crisis intervention, all I found were definitions based on medical model. And there was so much intrinsic blame and stigma within them. And this one particularly, when I read it, I remember thinking, what? Crisis intervention is the urgent temporary care given to an individual in order to interrupt downward spiral of maladaptive behavior and return the individual to their usual level of functioning. I imagine, you know, if, if I were to share this with any of my clients, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to stop your downward spiral of maladaptive behavior, how badly it will feel to them. So I couldn't find a definition of crisis intervention that felt right for me. So this is what I came up for. For me, is a window of opportunity. I get this window of opportunity to share the space with a person who is facing an unfair amount of emotional, physical, practical barriers to move forward in life. And this is my window to do justice to them. And it's brief, it's immediate, and the goal here may be to navigate the crisis, to change the crisis, to tolerate the crisis, to overcome it, 
it depends on what the person in front of me needs and wants rather than what I think they should do. So what is possible and what should be avoided? Crisis intervention isn't therapy, even for those of us who are perfectly capable of doing a deep dive of clinical work, that's not what crisis intervention is. And most importantly, I think in you know what Josie referred to the part of us that said, I need to fix this, we might inadvertently ended up telling someone who we think is in a very vulnerable space, we might end up telling them what to do with good intention because we want to rescue them because we want to fix the situation. But that's the worst thing that you can do to someone in crisis because the message that is captured by their brain is a message that they've probably heard their entire life. I'm not capable of making good decisions. I don't know what to do with my life. So why, why is crisis intervention often very challenging with survivors of trauma? What survivors of trauma have taught me and told me is that their life becomes a maze and there are so many different directions and they're trying to get out of one situation, but it's a maze and they don't know how to get to the end of it. They don't know how to exit their situation. They are told all sorts of contradicting things. They are told, um, I used to work in family court with survivors who have cases in family court and in criminal court. One judge will tell them one thing Another judge will contradict exactly that. Law enforcement would say another thing. The case manager, the advocate, and the therapist would say different things. Obviously, the brain is going to short circuit when you're told everything and the contrary and everything. And what one survivor told me, it told me, Verena, it feels like I'm in a game of chess. And the other person is always making the right move. And no matter what move I make, I can never protect myself. I can never protect the things that matter to me. So trauma is often what is left with us is the fact that we are going to have reactions instead of responses. Trauma is going to steal from us the ability to be in a stressful experience without becoming overtaken from it. So when we approach crisis intervention, we have to keep in mind that oftentimes the result of trauma is that things that we take for granted, the ability to be like, let me take a moment here, let me breathe, let me remind myself that now is not forever. Let me remind myself that I can, I'm capable of transforming this moment. All of the elements that we take for granted as part of our wellness um, tool, they are often out of reach for survivors of trauma because of the courageous adaptations that they've had to make. So one of the goals of crisis intervention is not to sugarcoat, is not to find a happy ending to a situation that is unfair, there are times in which crisis intervention is about something that we simply cannot change. The idea of we have no control when it comes to justice in the outcome, but we have control when it comes to procedural justice. So a reaction feels like something that happened to us, but if I can behave in ways that allow the survivor that I'm sharing this space with to choose a response rather than have a reaction, that experience with me in the room will not replicate trauma. So what, I'm, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna make sure that I allow the survivor to retain control and to make choices so that they can feel that they have a sense of what is happening to them. Because remember, trauma is marked by an idea of there is nothing I can do to change what is happening. In practice, what are reactive emotions? Emotions that are out of our control when it, when it comes to choosing, we don't really get to choose whether or not we are rageful, whether or not we are overtaken by grief, whether or not we are terrified. A responsive emotion, which is something that we're gonna encounter doing in crisis intervention, because again, we're gonna share the space with survivors who are going through injustice. So they have the right to be angry. They have the right to be in the company of grief, to be concerned. It is traumatizing to be terrified. It's okay to be concerned. And if I can do anything so that the person in the room with me feels concerned rather than terrified, I'm doing justice by them. Shock, numb, defeated, dissociated, those replicate trauma reactions. My survivors, the survivors I work with, 
they're going to be disappointed all the time because the system is rigged against them. So sometimes they're going to be surprised. They thought they were going to get an apartment through a voucher. The voucher disappeared. They are going to be surprised. They might be have to contemplate their next option. They might be really disappointed. But I don't want them. I hope that I'm going to be able to not facilitate a response that is shocked, numbed, or defeated. So based on the work of Daniel Siegel, we are going to remember that every time we share space with someone who's going through a crisis, we can make a deposit either in the this is a trusting relationship, a deposit into hope for what it means to connect with another person, or unfortunately, sometimes we can make a deposit in the account of people are not to be trusted, and we're going to try to make a deposit in the right account. So Daniel Siegel talks about this idea that in order to have a secure connection with someone, you need to feel seen, you need to feel suited, and you need to feel safe. In crisis intervention, we are going to attune to our client internal and external state. We're going to take the time to understand what's going on and what they really want. We're going to be present, as Josie spoke about. We're going to be calm. And as Josie talked about, progression, not perfection. If I had crisis interventions where I wasn't calm at all, and sometimes I think the survivor ended up taking care of me rather than the other way around, it happened. But it has taught me a lesson about how important it is for me to do my own work. We are going to commit to not be a source of fear. And as Josie mentioned before, we are going to repair, repair, repair. Small repair big repair. All of this should result in the person feeling that they, during this crisis, they had one secure connection. So I'm going to go quickly to this case study and tell you about uh, a person I not so much worked with, but when I worked in a domestic violence shelter many, many, many years ago, Josie and I have been doing this work longer than we care to admit, I think. But this, we are talking about over 10 years ago, and this case has never left me because I observed a well-intended service provider who did not give justice to this person. And I remember it to this day, and to this day, I wish that I could go back and provide justice to this person. And I'm going to show you what happened, and I'm going to show you what I hope I can do for this person when I encounter this person now, and when I, what I hope you are able to do. So Mary is meeting with her case manager at the DV shelter where she's been residing with her 11-year-old son for the past two months. Previously, she had gone to PATH. She had been in a family shelter, but her former partner was able to locate her. Mary has an order of protection in family court, and she also has several upcoming dates in criminal court. She experienced childhood sexual abuse, and this is the second attempt that she has made at escaping the violence. The first time she stayed in the shelter, she kept going and she was told that she was going to be able to secure housing, but she couldn't find a landlord that was willing to take her voucher. So much injustice in, in her life. So this is the interaction that I witnessed, and this is what I hope today, over 10 years later, if I have to ever meet Mary again, this is what I hope I'll be able to provide her with. So Mary came in and said, I am feeling really overwhelmed right now. And from the get-go, I remember it as it was yesterday. She was activating and she was shaking. The server provider said, mm, what's happening? There's nothing wrong with that. Now, knowing everything that I know, I would probably say, I'm here. I'm here with you. What's happening? With a tone of voice that sends the message that I want to share the experience with them. My son's school just called this yes, and now I have to deal with them. And I just, I cannot do this anymore. And I, you know, feel free to put in the chat what comes up for you as you um, witness what the service provider did and what I hope I will be able to do. Why did they call this yes? It's one of the why questions Josie was talking about before. It's nothing terribly wrong about this question, but it's not meeting the survivor in the space in which she's in. 
So what I would say to her now is, this is so tough. I'm really sorry that you have to go through this too. You have gone through so much already. Do you want to tell me more about it? I'm going to ask the survivor. Maybe she has no interest in telling me why they call this yes. At this point, she's breaking down. She's raising her voice. What do they want from me? Of course, he misses school. We are being moved from one shelter to another. We are forced to attend a million appointments. What do they expect? I don't think I can even talk to them. Honestly, I'm going to effing curse them out. And the service provider said, okay, I understand, but I don't think that that will be helpful right now. Can we think of another way of handling this situation? Taken by itself is not a terrible thing to say, but I guess it misses joining the survivor in the experience they're having in the moment. So what I hope I would say to them is, I wouldn't blame you. I'll be concerned that it might make things worse for you, and, but I wouldn't blame you. You have been through so much already. I'm going to let the survivor know, I get it. Of course, this is the way you're feeling. I'm with you in this experience before I'm going to attempt to change the way that she's going to respond to that. Josie, do we have time to solicit feedback or do I just have to go to the next slide? Go for it. We go to the next slide or we solicit feedback? Go for the feedback. All righty, people. Let me open the chat. What's coming up for you? What do you think is happening with the survivor? What do you think you would say to them at this point? What do you think is happening with the service provider? And I see, Andrea, that your hand is raised. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to unmute and share a question? You're also welcome to share any thoughts in the chat, Andrea. Someone say, for me, it sounds like the woman's feelings aren't being validated and could leave her feeling that a reaction are wrong and inappropriate. Nicole, yes. Feeling uncomfortable about how the person is speaking to the client and not realizing how the client is getting activated. Yes. And even back then, so many years ago, when I knew nothing, basically, I felt uncomfortable. I didn't even know why I felt uncomfortable. I just remember thinking, something is wrong here. Important to sit with the client and the feelings and validating rather than going straight to how to fix it. Yeah. The service provider wants to work quickly to get a solution, perhaps because their fixed parts are coming online. I'm curious about what interferes with the service provider being more attuned. Yeah, is the service provider afraid? Are they concerned that they are not going to be able to help? I think the service provider is trying to protect the client, but that means they're also taking on the responsibility for the client behavior. Yeah, this is so helpful, Verena. Thank you. It is so very nuanced, uh, but the distinctions between the first and the third column are truly profound. It is so clear that you are with the person as opposed to alongside them. Thank you. I should share... Zach and I both work for the DAF program, so it's clearly been paid to pay me such beautiful compliment. Um, service provider might be less experienced and not quite know what the response is being, why the response is being taken badly. A lot, I, I, I wish I could read, read them all, but you're all, yes. Of course, Mary is angry and overwhelmed. Her whole life has been appended countless time, yeah. I understand what you're saying and how you're feeling. Oh, I'm here to support you. Tell me how I can help you. Frida, thank you so much. It is important to meet them where they are and acknowledge their feelings. Yeah, yeah, all of that, all of that is exactly what we were, were hoping to hear from an engaged um, audience. I really like the mindset of validating even though it might not feel like the best choice. I think it allows time to process, yes. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to show you how the interaction ended, and I'm going to tell you briefly about something that is really important. Mary said, 
I just don't know if I can keep going like this anymore. This is like when I was a kid and my school called ACS all went down here from there. I ended up being in a house where I was molested and no one believed me. I'm not sure I can keep going. So she went from being tremendously activating and now she's shutting down. The service provider said, are you thinking of hurting yourself? By itself is not the wrong question. It's definitely at the wrong time. So what I wish I could have said back then, what I hope I always gonna say now is first and foremost, I believe you. Because we have to make the implicit explicit. It might be explicit to me that I believe my survivor, but it's not explicit to them. So let's make the implicit explicit and once we have done that, let's take it a step further and let's make the explicit experiential. I don't know about you, but the survivors I work with, they need an experience a lot more than they need an, exper an, an explanation. They need an experience of dignity, of transparency, of calm, of honesty, of feeling in control. And that's what we're going to do. So I would say, I'm sorry that happened to you. Can you, do you want to tell me more about not knowing if you can keep going like this. I mean, I'm not suicidal, that's what Mary said. I'll never do that to my son, but I feel like I have no energy left in me to do this alone, to do this on my own. And the service provider said, what do you think you need the most right now? And I want to highlight that this is a good intervention. We do need to ask our clients, what do you think you need the most right now? But the client just told us, they don't want to do this alone. So I'm just asking you to think about it on your own. What do you need now? You just told me you don't want to do this on your own. So what I would say is, I'm here you. I'm here. Maybe there is something I can do to help you feel less alone. This is where I'm going to take it and try to see if I can lessen the burden for Mary, if, even if just for a moment. And at this point, she just felt so defeated. She just said, she just checked out. She said, I don't even know what I need. The service provider said something that makes no sense in this situation. She said, well, do you think you might need to speak with someone about the sexual abuse? I could make a referral to a rape crisis service agency. Wrong intervention, wrong time. What I would say is I can't tell you what you need to do either. But maybe if we work together, I think we might be able to figure something out. There is nothing wrong about making a referral for the survivor to, to see someone who specializes in the victimization that they've experienced, but don't make a referral at, at the time in which the survivor is going to feel that we are not accepting who they are in the moment with us. My favorite quote when it comes to crisis intervention, I'm not a teacher, I'm a fellow traveler of whom you've asked the way. I pointed ahead, ahead of myself as well as you. We are walking this journey together. I may have some information you don't, but you have the power and control to make the decisions. I'm just walking alongside you. Ah, uh, Josie, go, go, make this impossible thing happen you have like 20 slides in three minutes I don't know <laughs> yeah so what I was going to say was thank you because I think the case example was really resonating with folks um, and saying that this is very helpful and what I was thinking about was this idea of the interventions being directed to cognitive right so like what do you want to do right now what kind of decisions do you want to make are you right? That's going here. And what we want to think about is that when people are in those responses, if we're thinking back to those scales and those weights at the beginning, we want to kind of help speak to the parts of the brain that are worried about survival. Um, and, and so just thinking about those, any responses that are going to be too much about the cognitive or too much focusing on just those lyrics, what I noticed about Verena's I wish responses were all very talking about you're not alone. I'm in this with you, you know, that kind of idea of joining. And I think that's really important. So here is where we were going to talk about um, self-preservation. I am thinking we can pivot. Verena, I didn't even talk to you about this, but I'm looking at time. Time management, not my forte, as you can tell. 
I think that's what happens when you prepare 74 slides when you have an hour. But what I was thinking is that we could use the rest of our time because I want to be respectful of the fact that we're ending at 2.30 for, for questions and answers. Um, so the self-preservation, like everyone has copies of the slides. We can think about how to do that. There's some resources there as well. Um, but I'm really interested in um, your questions and like having some more dialogue now. So Verena, if it's okay with you, I think we could just take them. Yeah. What I did want to also acknowledge is when I, um, my language before was not great when I talked about getting used to being in trauma. And what I wanted to do was correct that and think about this idea of Sometimes, you know, there, it feels like we have a choice to hold on to our trauma responses and adaptations. Um, and a lot of times if we're dealing with chronic or continual trauma, um, what we're talking about is honoring that adaptability and recognizing that there are very good reasons why certain patterns are necessary and maintained. So I apologize for my narrow sightedness in thinking about the response to that question. Um, okay. So oh, yeah, Mia, it looks like we do have questions that are coming up. We do. Um, so we have two in the Q and A function that I'll share. Um, so we have, do you have any tips, suggestions, or suggested approach for social workers that provide short-term crisis intervention to older adults? Who are victims of crime and now have and are now coping with trauma. We've got um, one more. Do children pick up on our trauma without realizing it? We're going from older adults to children, really. The Same. full range. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, so I think you know, in returning back to like the idea of we're basic is Verena and I talk about this a lot is that sometimes we're like are we too basic like are the things that we're saying really obvious and I think in in a sense yes they are and I think there are things like based on the responses that everyone had to how are you incorporating trauma in your work you you know this stuff but I think it's a good reminder that the basics are there for you right and so if we are thinking about presence and we're thinking about matching our presence to the people we're working with, especially when we're thinking about this idea of going through a traumatic experience or traumatic experiences is isolating, um, what can we do to help increase that person's feeling of not being alone in it? And that can be for individuals but that can also be in terms of thinking about communities and thinking about culture and thinking about all those things. So this idea of how do I, you know, how do I adapt my presence or be as present as I can in order to be with this person fully? How can I adapt that in terms of what I'm noticing or paying attention to? How can I follow their lead and focus on what's important to them rather than my part that says, oh, wait, I want to fix it. And what's important to me? Verena, do you have some ideas and thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Everything, everything that you said, plus, you know, whenever we talk about a specific population is, again, to uh, remind ourselves that if there are added vulnerabilities, what it really means is that there are added barriers to justice. So in general, to be a survivor of abuse is unfair and it's difficult if you, on top of that, add a vulnerability created by this society, whether because the person is an immigrant and there are barriers to justice, because this person is an older adult, because this person is a child. Every time there is an added vulnerability is a time for me as an advocate to add even more justice into my work because I'm you know, sp sharing space with someone who's going through something difficult no matter what. And plus there are other vulnerabilities in place. I work in a hospital and I can tell you a lot of time when we get survivors of intimate partner violence or sexual assault who are quote unquote elderly, which I think in the United States it's 64, I'm not sure. Um, but older people, they're often treated with condescending, you know, with condescending behavior. So how do I respect 
the autonomy and dignity of this person in a world that seeks to label older people are not capable. Somewhat we stop being capable. Well, women stop being capable, what, 40? I don't know. <laughs> but somewhat we stop being capable when we are older. So um, to answer your question, my tip would be, be, be a fighter for that person's dignity in a society that seeks to strip them away from their dignity. And then I think there was a question of like children and picking up on trauma. Um, Let's make it bad because we don't feel bad enough. <laughs> As a new, new parent, um, of course, children pick, pick up on everything. <laughs> trauma, non-trauma. Um, what I tell a lot of the survivors of trauma were parents who are so worried about not traumatizing their kids is you only need to be a good enough parent. You don't need to be a perfect parent. You don't need to be a super healed parent. You just need to be good enough. Good enough means it's not that you're not going to make mistakes. You're going to repair. So your trauma shows up in your parenting because you're human. You're going to repair and you're going to show your kid that is, trauma is a part of you, but there is so much more to you. So as long as you repair, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah and I think the fact that parents like if you're asking that question and you have some awareness of you know how your history might impact uh your parenting it means that you're doing a good job because you're doing it with reflection and presence do we have other questions Mia we do um they just keep coming in so I think we can assume that there will always be more um one is the case study with Mary, is that a time when the idea is that there's power in silent support? Um, and after that, I can pose the other questions. Sorry, Mia, can you repeat it for a second? Sure. The Is the case study with Mary the idea that there is power in silent support? Mm. I, I like the idea of silent support, which can mean both being okay with silence and allow Mary to just be the way she is because there is nothing wrong with that or silent support because it's the absence of directive, is the absence of telling Mary what to do. There is so much power in silent support if it's done with presence and empathy and recognition of the person in front of you, absolutely. And I think like when it comes to working with people who have experienced harm, this idea of pacing, is important and that's going to look different for everyone um we want to be aware of this idea of like flood and this idea of like too much right and overwhelm but we also want to be aware of like if we're thinking about like this extending this water analogy like turning off and like having like a clogged pipe so we want to find the flow that works for not just the person but for the moment so yes i encourage silence I also know when silence is getting like long and potentially awkward, right? So it's about finding that rate. Thank you both. Another question we have is, do you have any suggestions for how to compassionately continue to set boundaries with clients who have crossed them? For example, they refer to you as a friend, message or call you about things that you cannot provide services for. I provide emergency short-term resources and referrals to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Yeah, I would say that I'm always going to be a big supporter of boundaries um, as a part of our self-preservation. And I think also as a necessary part of our being able to sustain ourselves and to do this work. Um, and I would say that one of the things that I work with most frequently is how people manage um, knowing that they are a frontline and first person provider. And often, you know, the person that people say, you know, you're the only person I've ever told this to, or you're the first person who's really listened to me and how we balance that with what we can do. Right. So it goes into this idea of thinking about that we're working in these imperfect systems um, where people's needs are here and what systems can provide them is here and having to be the ones who navigate in between those and continue to fight so that systems can widen and work the way that they're supposed to. 
Um, but this idea of, you know, we need to think about that we're not doing the work alone and be realistic about what we can provide support and help for and what we can't. Anything to add, Verena? Everything that Josie said and the, the idea that what we know about trauma perhaps gives us an explanation of why there, are, there is some boundary crossing, but an explanation doesn't, just because we understand something, it doesn't mean that we have to go along with it. But it's important because the story we tell ourselves are going to determine how do I approach setting boundaries with this person. If the story I tell myself is, well, this person just doesn't have any boundaries because they don't want to, I'm going to approach it one way. If the story I tell myself is, what has happened to this person that has caused boundaries to be something difficult for them, then I'm still going to hold my boundary, but I'm going to be empathic, I'm going to be kind, I can be firm. But again, I think the story we tell ourselves is really important. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, and thank you to the most to Josie and Verena. That was just a fantastic webinar. And and we've received so much feedback already in the chat and the Q and A. Um, I do want to just, you know, remind folks that um, we're we're really thankful for you to attend. And also, as mentioned a few times, um, we we can offer part twos. We can offer part or follow ups to small groups to organizations. Um, the only thing we need is a request form from you all. So if, if you'd like to fill out a request form requesting a part two, um, we're happy to get in touch and figure out what that could look like. Um, and just a reminder, this was offered through TARP, through OBS. Um, and we have here an evaluation link. Um, we'll put the link in the chat, but you can also use this QR code. Blink mentioned it at the top of the call. Um, it really helps us, your, your feedback really helps us improve TARP, offer new webinars, offer follow-ups, um, and also helps Josie and Verena as, as well in their work. Um, so I'll leave this up for a few minutes and and Rachel Blake, if there's anything else I missed. Sure, thank you so much, Mia, and thank you everyone. The, the anecdotal comments we've been seeing are just tremendous. So thank you and thank you, Verena and Josie. This was absolutely fabulous. Please do complete the evaluation. As Mia said, it helps us get more content like this for you all. But quick question, Mia, if I did want to do my own customized training, I forgot, how much does that cost? I'm so happy you asked. It is free of charge to you. Free. That's my favorite cost. Yep. With a capital F, it's free. All we need is a request form, and then we offer um, the support and training and technical assistance you need. I do just want to say really quickly, it's an amazing program. It is, it, you can build it to exactly what your program needs. I know it might sound overwhelming to get started, but if you give us just a little bit of information on what you're looking for, ISLG takes it from there. This program is only at this point going through September, so it could be going away. Uh, so really act now. I know I sound like a used car salesman, but it is one of the greatest opportunities for your program to build their organizational capacity and it is it's it's available now so please 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 consider taking part and submitting a request any closing words Raina Josie thank you thank you so much for allowing us to be here and we cannot wait to be back and I want to thank everyone who was on the call for the work that you do every day with trauma and choosing to engage with things that most of most people um, don't choose to do. So um, you're the real heroes and we can create the change that we want in the world by continuing to engage with our whole humanity. Thank you, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.